My patients are treated with a combination of both antibiotic, anti-infective treatment, as well as allergy treatment. Uh, the patients have usually been treated on at least uh, two to three courses of antibiotics, as well as a combination of nasal steroids, uh, nasal antihistamines or oral antihistamines, uh, decongestants, nasal irrigation, and often usually at least one course of oral steroids. I'll preface your answer by saying that I do think the CT scan is important and I order a, a CT scan to evaluate each and every patient prior to this procedure, but I don't use that as a sole determinant as to whether or not they're indicated for this procedure. Having said that, I'm looking for osteomatal complex obstruction, severe narrowing that would explain their recurring or chronic symptoms, uh, mucosal thickening, fluid in uh, any of the sinuses. Uh, I'm looking for opacification in any of the sinuses or any evidence of what would be uh, mucosal outflow obstruction. All of the patients that I treated today have failed a combination of antibiotic and allergy treatment. Uh, they have presented with uh, symptoms that have been persistent over a two to three month period uh, or have been persisting over a shorter period of time yet have been unremitting. I've examined each and every one of these patients in quite detail. Each of these patients has been suffering from chronic symptoms over the two to three month period or has been, suffer or has been suffering significantly with debilitating symptoms over a three to four week period of time and has failed medical treatment. In that situation, the quality of life has been significantly affected. This procedure offers me a very conservative approach to treat their symptoms that are failing medical treatment without the aggressive approach of going to the operating room, uh, without, the, without the aggressive approach of going to the operating room, exposing the risks of a general anesthetic, undergoing a procedure that is going to require a longer period of recovery, as well as the uh, necessary expenses that are occurred in a hospitalization. I've examined these patients in detail uh, and taken into account their, their, um, their emotional state. I've taken into account whether they would be a good candidate based on whether they might have too high a level of anxiety, whether I think that they would be able to be relaxed enough to undergo this procedure under an oral sedation. What I'll often do is first ask a patient if they're familiar with what an angioplasty is. Because what we're essentially doing is going in with a catheter, sliding a balloon over the catheter, and dilating the sinuses. I give them the analogy of an hourglass. Imagine the top half of the hourglass is supposed to drain into the bottom half of the hourglass, but you got a really narrow neck. I can put a little catheter down that narrow neck with the light at the tip, and that tip confirms where I am in terms of position, slide a little balloon over the catheter, inflate the balloon, and that narrow neck expands outwards, but it stays out. It stays expanded because I'm dilating the bone, not just the soft tissue. After it's dilated, I deflate the balloon, slide it back over the catheter, remove it from the nose. And that's how I analogize this experience of a sinus dilation. This, this procedure is a conservative approach that is meant to deal with sinus obstruction. This procedure is a very conservative procedure that allows me to deal with a situation of, of obstruction. There's obstruction in the sinuses. It's not responding to medical treatment. Prior to this time, I was needing to bring each and every one of these patients to the operating room. Or if not to the operating room, just dealing with their recurring symptoms and trying to manage them on an episodic basis. This approach is less invasive. It's just as efficacious. There's no risk of the general anesthetic. It allows people to return to work faster. The recovery is easier. Not to mention the fact that this procedure allows me to dilate and open the sinuses on patients who otherwise wouldn't be candidates for a general anesthetic, whether it's an elderly patient or a younger patient who just isn't a good medical candidate. I go very slowly in describing the procedure to the patient ensuring the fact that I have given them each and every opportunity to answer all their questions. I will oftentimes show them an animated video. 
And I describe to them how they will be sedated at home with some oral Ativan, as well as some hydrocodone. And then I'll go into detail of how I use an anesthetic gel that I've developed that I actually squirt onto the tissues that allows me to then anesthetize the nose with cotton balls and cotton pledges. I describe to them how the anesthesia is actually administered in stages and how we go very, very slowly to get them to a very deep level of anesthesia given the fact that we're using no IV sedation. And more often than not, the patients are very comfortable once they receive that explanation. I think the patients tolerate the procedures very well. If I have a patient who's uh, very anxious, extremely anxious during the procedure, they will usually be responding with a sigh or with uh, some verbal or body expression indicating some significant pain. I didn't receive any feedback like that today and I, and I think that whatever anxiety any of my patients did experience was well controlled with the medication. The Express device worked like a charm. It enables me to access the sinuses with a great degree of ease and very little trauma to the surrounding tissues. Uh, it has a very malleable tip that allows me to bend it in whatever position I need, whether it's uh, going from frontal to sphenoid, sphenoid to frontal. It allows me to uh, mold the, the tip as easily as I would ex could expect uh, to get into the maxillary sinuses. The low profile is a fantastic device and allows me to perform the dilation with minimal trauma to the patient and maximal comfort. The new low profile device has an LED light source built into it. It prevents me from needing to connect an external light source to the device. It's lighter, it's easier to manipulate, and it's all, uh, all around just uh, uh, of greater ease. Uh, and in terms of ergonomics, it's very comfortable in the hand, it's very well balanced, um, and I think it's just a great improvement. The keys to success, one, keep the patient relaxed. The patient must be relaxed in order to have not just a satisfactory, but an excellent therapeutic response and emotional response. I found that a high degree of anxiety leads to a higher perception of pain. Make sure you're comfortable with the balloon. If you're, on, if you're not comfortable using it in the office, do a few cases in the operating room until you feel comfortable. Because if you're not comfortable with the balloon in your hand, the patient's going to recognize it and you're not going to get the full therapeutic effect. Thirdly, be confident. Be confident in your anatomy. Be confident in your ability to interact with the patient. And your confidence will be interpreted by the patient as another blanket of comfort.